Welcome to Medicare for All Explained. This podcast will enlighten our listeners and dispel the distortions that surround Medicare for All. Medicare for All Explained is produced in collaboration with Physicians for a National Health Program and is hosted and produced by Joe Sparks. I'm your host, Joe Sparks. This is episode 105, People's Action in Healthcare for All. My guest, Aisha Nimer Anarud, is the Healthcare for All Campaign Director at People's Action. Aisha will describe People's Action's purpose and goals and how Healthcare for All fits into their overall purpose. They will also describe what People's Action is currently emphasizing in healthcare. Aisha Nimer Anarud, welcome to Medicare for All Explain. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. I'd like to start out with a question because I'm not sure most people know about your organization. So could you please tell me what is People's Action? Yeah, absolutely. So People's Action, we're a national network of community organizations. We have 40 affiliates in 29 states. All of our affiliates work on economic, racial, environmental justice issues of different kinds. And healthcare is, of course, one of those big issues because it has a big impact on people in terms of their economics, in terms of social justice, gender justice, all of that. And we've been around for 40-something years at this point. We've got a long history. That sounds great. So you started in this a little bit, but what are people's actions, purpose, and goals? Yeah, so we really... We build, um, I'm going to say we speaking about our network because we're really made up of our affiliates around the country. So we build people power, right? Um, In our country, a lot of what rules is money power. um, And we got a corporate power and we need a counterbalance to that. And that's a lot of what we build at People's Action. So we work with community organizations to to build leadership, build base of people engaged and active, um, and build campaigns where we can actually fight back against our oppressors, basically. What do you do to build up the network so that you can counter the power of money? Because that's a really big issue. It is. It is. And it's a really big issue about why we can't get Medicare for all yet. So, you know, a lot of it is really just building one-on-one relationships, right? Like if you're an organizer in your community, you probably know a lot of people. um, And a lot of your role is really to find folks and figure out what drives them and what motivates them and figure out where there's commonalities so that we can take action together to advance a shared vision of the world, a shared agenda, a shared fight back. And then working with folks to develop their leadership as they take on more and more intimidating things because it can be intimidating to be going up against these powerful institutions right so a lot of the work of an organizer is kind of shepherding people through that process of learning that they can fight back and that they can build power and yeah so what would you consider either people's actions or your most recent successes in terms of organizing and fighting the moneyed interests yeah It's a big question. Uh, (laughs) Just thinking about like in the, in the scope of how much we're up against right now. Um, Yeah. Recent examples. um, Our folks did a lot of work to pass the MAT Act, Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act, um, to help people who have substance use disorder actually be able to get, um, access to harm reduction services. And that was tough to get and was a big part of um, the work that that campaign, the overdose, um, our campaign to fight the overdose epidemic was working on. So that will lead me into healthcare. And again, you touched on this, but I'd like to know why healthcare is so important to people's action. Yeah, so a lot of our 
organizations, a lot of our affiliates around the country did do work on the Affordable Care Act back in the day. And, you know, that passed. And I will say, I do believe it has made some positive impacts in people's lives, but it also does not go nearly far enough. And it also does entrench corporate interests, right? Um, It creates more opportunity for these health insurance companies to make money and like build some more of their own power. So it's tricky. But basically our folks, you know, were in that fight and just found it was really like, even though we have passed the ACA decades ago now, like it's still not, people are still not able to get the care they need, even with insurance. But fundamentally our organizations are made up of, for the most part, poor and working people. And there's still some people who, especially in the South, who aren't able to get coverage, but more and more we're hearing from people who do have health insurance and are still not able to get the care that they need and that their provider says they need. Um, So that's a lot of why we're in this fight. So you mentioned it's under insurance where you have insurance, but you still can't get the coverage you need. Just a couple of quick points. What I tell people is, are we better off with the ACA than without it? And I think the answer is definitely yes. But I also think, as you said, it doesn't go far enough. And we need to go to the next step, which is Medicare for all. But before we get into that, I would sure like to hear about the Care Over Cost campaign that is being done by People's Action. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Excited to talk about that because it's my baby. So the Care Over Cost campaign really came out of a couple places for us. You know, our organization, like I was saying, we really are grounded in Medicare for All as like a really important milestone that we're working towards. But as we were kind of looking around at our work, our assessment was we didn't really have much strategy for getting to Medicare for All and like actually building the power that we need to contest with the corporate influence, right? Like, the whole healthcare industry, but especially the insurance corporations, they have a lot to lose if we move to a single payer system. And so you can see it reflected in the way that they spend money on lobbying and political contributions and all that, right? To make sure that we're not getting the substantial reform we need. So for us, we were like kind of thinking about what um, what can we do that would allow us to build our power as a movement like a progressive movement fighting for healthcare, and would also take down the influence a notch um, of the insurance companies. And we also looked around at our base and and were asking folks about what they were experiencing with their insurance and what problems they faced. And what we were hearing a lot was about care denials, situations where people, like I was saying, have insurance, but they still can't get care that they need And sometimes that looks like prior authorization denial where, you know, your doctor or your medical provider puts in um, a prescription or like a request for some kind of treatment. And then the insurance company tells you, no, we're not going to pay for it. You can't get it. Sometimes it's a claim denial after you've gotten the treatment and then you find out the insurance company isn't going to pay for it. So it leaves you on the hook. And sometimes it's inadequate provider networks, right? Especially in rural areas, there's a lot of instances where, you know, if somebody needs to see a specialist, there might not be somebody within even one or two hours drive of where they live, who's actually in their insurance network. So we were hearing about all these things and we are thinking, oh, like we should really be drawing more attention to this, right? Like people don't really talk about this. What we find even when we knock on people's doors is, the first thing they say is usually, well, I'm just like really lucky to have insurance, right? Because in this country, everybody knows that healthcare is such a mess. So they're just grateful to have what they have. But when you start sharing stories about your experience or the experience of your loved ones, and they had a claim denial or a prior authorization denial, um, and the impact that had where they couldn't get a surgery they needed, or they couldn't get a medication they needed, And sometimes it's minimal, but sometimes it's like life threatening, you know, then people really start thinking about their own experiences in those terms too, and start getting angry. And that's when you can organize. So 
that's kind of at the basis of our campaign and um, what we do with people is we fight back, basically. And I could get into that, but I don't know if you want me to monologue this much. <laughs> Actually, yes, I would really like to hear how you and people's action fight back. Yeah, so basically we find folks who are experiencing denials from their insurance company. And when we do that, we've got a two-prong approach. One is we actually have a national appeals team that's set up with volunteers who have legal experience or medical experience, and they can help guide people through the appeals process with the insurance company. Because that process can be really complicated and daunting and time-consuming and honestly horrible. It's a horrible experience, um, which is why if you look at um, ACA plans, only 0.2% of people with denials appeal. That's less than 1%. And so if I may, yeah. I'd like to point out that insurance companies and companies try to make the complaint process hard to discourage complaints. That is my belief, yes. <laughs> I, I probably can't prove it, but I absolutely believe that. <laughs> yeah, they make it really time-consuming and complicated and confusing, and then you end up with more than 99% of the time, people are not actually appealing when they have the right to. So we help people go through the appeals process. But we also don't think that's enough. And we also don't think that it should just be done between you and the insurance company. Part of what we do is we help people see if you're getting denied by your insurance company, that's not just a you problem. This is not like something you have done wrong or like a situation where you don't have good enough insurance. It's a situation where our system is failing you and like your community will have your back actually. And we can fight this together. And like your fight with the insurance company is my fight with the insurance company. So we help people take their fights public at the same time through petitions, uh, social media campaigns, direct actions. We've even gotten some U.S. senators involved, things like that, and actually are able to win care for people when they've been denied over and over again by doing this. Well, that's great. So let me ask a question. ProPublica recently came out with a story about how at Cigna, doctors could deny care without even opening mm -hmm. the case. There's been other things that come out that said, we do not track denials of care, so nobody really knows how often it happens. So has People Action thought about fighting for legislation that would track care denials? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, transparency is really like the baseline of the problem. As we've been reaching out to folks, we have some anecdotal experience that shows us that poor people, people of color, people in rural areas tend to get more denials, but we don't have proof of that because of these data transparency issues. So yes, absolutely. And also there are some metrics that are supposed to be tracked by uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, um, that they just are not. So we've also been Talk, putting some pressure on um, Department of Health and Human Services to actually follow through with what they have the authority to do right now. So as I often try to explain to people, sometimes having health insurance doesn't mean squat. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people equate health insurance with health coverage. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. And I just find that something to emphasize. So now you're doing this care over cost campaign. And how do you plan to move from that to Medicare for all? Because I assume you think we need Medicare for all. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the entire path is not laid out, I'll be honest. But, um, you know, we see this, the care over cost campaign as an opportunity to really publicly highlight the ways that private insurance is failing us every day. There are at least 248 million claim denials per year. And that's almost one for every person in the country, right? That's a huge number. And each one of those represents a different treatment someone has not been able to get. So I think by exposing the ways that private insurance is failing to meet people's needs and um, really kind of coming up against this narrative, I think a lot of us who do have insurance think, oh, you know, maybe that happened to that person, but like, I'll be okay. 
but the re the truth is like yeah maybe but like also very likely you or someone you love is going to be really harmed by your private insurance company at some point in your life especially if you get really sick or injured that's when when these denials really happen the most so what we want to do is expose that fact and help people understand private insurance is not the answer to our healthcare needs in this country and as we're doing that, we also have plans to start building some, um, you know, federal and state level legislative campaigns, regulatory campaigns to rein in this problem, rein in the profiteering that the insurance companies are doing. Like if you look at Medicaid and Medicare, huge chunks of these programs are privatized now, right? And so those are places where the insurance companies are able to take money, public money that is supposed to be paying for our care and skim it off the top by denying us, right? If they deny more claims, they get more money. And so we want to really be able to rein in those practices as well through different legislative and regulatory paths. I am a senior. I've been on Medicare for a couple of years. And because of this podcast, I knew that I wanted traditional Medicare with a Medigap program and not Medicare disadvantages, mm -hmm. many people like to call it. But in terms of what the public thinks. So my wife watches some of the cable news, not Fox, and there's a ton of Medicare Advantage ads on those networks, especially starting around September or October, because the sign-up period for Medicare starts on October 15th. And she said, if it wasn't for me and what I've done, she might have been tempted to get a Medicare Advantage plan. Mm-hmm. Because, as you say, they have the money, the advertising is very slick, and while they generally don't lie, they leave out important facts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very tough when there's ad after ad in mailers, and a lot of people also get phone calls for Medicare Advantage, and it just keeps coming at you. So... When I first signed up for Medicare, I was doing this podcast for probably about three years or so. And I thought, oh, I know what I want with Medicare. I'm going to get Medicare and a Medigap plan. It'll be easy. Well, that was arrogant on my part. <laughs> and just to give you an idea of this one aspect of Medicare, they send out this guide and it's over 120 pages. Mm. So it's not simple. And most people aren't going to have the time to do that. So, which brings me up to another point, why we need Medicare for all, which I'd like your comments on. It would greatly simplify things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think anybody who has attempted to access healthcare in this country knows our, our system is exceedingly complicated between the different types of coverage you can have, the different uh, networks that come with that coverage, what is and is not included in your plan. Um, we talk a lot about how, just how complicated insurance companies make even their plan documents, right? So you can't even figure out if the denial that you received was actually in accordance with your plan or not. And many times they're not. Many times like something is supposed to be covered in your plan and they're denying it anyway but you have to comb through like a 300 page document to figure that out. So yeah, a lot, a lot would be a lot simpler if we had one, one payer in this country, right? If we had Medicare for all system, all of these complexities are basically, they equate to roadblocks that keep people from getting care, whether or not the insurance companies have intended it that way. You know, you could argue about that, I guess, but the effect is certainly that, they get less care, less care that they need. I would argue the insurance companies want to maximize their profits. Mm -hmm. And so it's intentional. The way you maximize profits in our current healthcare system is to deny care. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the executive compensation or the stock buybacks, you look at these super inflated amounts of money that these companies, even the nonprofits, you know, in terms of executive compensation and net revenue and all this, like those millions or sometimes billions of dollars 
Like those are all dollars that could be going to people getting this surgery or this medication or in this doctor's appointment that they need, um, but they're getting denied instead. I always thought it'd be fun to tie healthcare company profits and the CEO's executive compensation to how well our healthcare system performs. Mm. And if it doesn't perform well, they don't make much. It's still simpler to have Medicare for all, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, given our current system, that's kind of a, that's a fantasy of mine. So before we end, is there anything that you'd like to add, whether it be about healthcare or how people could get involved with people's action? Yeah. Um, I mean, if you're somebody who cares about people actually being able to get the care they need. Um, and somebody who supports Medicare for all. Yeah, we'd love to have you get involved in our work. People's Action, we operate mainly through our affiliates. So if you are in one of the uh, 29 states where we are, <laughs> that's the simplest way you can get involved. It's peoplesaction.org, isn't it? Yeah. It is, but that's not like the easiest way for them. Yeah, if you well, go to careovercost.org, there will be a sign-up form there where you can get in touch with us. And we'd love to have you get involved. We need everybody we can get in on the fight. Aisha, thank you so much for being on Medicare for All Explained. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure, Joe. You have been listening to Medicare for All Explained. Remember to tell your family, friends, and colleagues about this podcast. Information about Medicare for All Explained can be found at our website, medicareforallexplained.org. The music for this show is Super Bubbly by Jesse Spillane. The logo was created by Lily Sparks. Thank you for listening.